Hi everybody! Welcome to Content Area 5, The Art of the Americas. I'm going to jump right into it today. And here we go. We'll start with some historical context. Uh, remember, we're talking about a very large area of the world. Uh, we're talking about Mesoamerica, so this is the area of some of Central America and Mexico. Uh, we're talking about South America, uh, specifically around the region of Peru. And we're talking about North America, and that's probably the most spread out area that we're looking at, uh, with everything from different areas of the United States, east, west, and in the middle, and then also up to the northern Can Canadian coast. Uh, so there's quite a range uh, when we look at North American, Native Americans. Uh, some overall ideas that you should know about. Uh, the art of this part of the world has one of the oldest art traditions. There's a lot of shamanistic tendencies in a lot of the cultures, um, belief that there would be a spiritual uh, leader that might help to connect to spirit worlds. A lot of the stylized uh, imagery would be human and animal hybrids, and a lot of times geometric motifs are used as well. Uh, most art objects have some sort of function, whether it's ritualistic or actually for use in daily life. Uh, and then astronomy and calendars play a large role in their particular culture. Uh, also, a lot of times there are pyramids and stone complexes, and those would be the um, city centers, uh, places for living, places for worship, um, just main city buildings. Uh, we know a lot of what we know from grave sites where a lot of art objects have been found. Um, and obviously there's a huge impact of when Europeans arrive to this area and then interact with the indigenous cultures uh, and then what follows. So that does impact the artwork as well. All right, so let's move on. Let's talk about Chavin. Uh, this is in the coastal Peru region in South America. Um, if we look at the timeline from 900 to 200 BCE, this is a very old, old uh, culture. Uh, and the civilization was actually named after the architectural site, uh, the main one for the city center. So Chavin de Huantar is the city center. Uh, so these are the images that you could expect to see. Um, we have everything from the ground plan that kind of shows us the layout and how close it is to a river. We have a lintel that's done in low relief with some symmetry. We have the Lanzon stone. Remember, this is in the main building, buried deep within. We'll talk about it more in a sec. And then we have a nose ornament, which would have been worn by somebody and performed, either man or woman. Uh, and it helps to connect them with the spirit world and take them, uh, turn them into a spirit, basically. So for this specific work, uh, we know that this was a religious capital. It was a place that people would go on pilgrimages to come to because it was so spiritual and important. Uh, inside the main building, it was very maze-like. I like to think of like the catacombs because there were multiple levels uh, and very, very narrow hallways um, that didn't always make complete sense. But very deep within was this lens on, which is a uh, word for a sword. So it kind of had the look of a sword. On that, there was low relief carving uh, in the image of this cult figure, uh, which is kind of a hybrid of human and animal forms. Now, this was believed to be the thing that people would go on pilgrimages to see or be close to, but it was something that few people had access to. It was buried, uh, you know, deep inside of this building, and so only specific people could actually go and see it. Um, but it was definitely a supernatural kind of uh, place and the cult figure had some kind of supernatural power uh, that would be used in ceremony. All right, so let's move on and we'll talk about the Mayans. Okay, so they were in the Mesoamerican region a little bit later on, 300 to 900 CE. Uh, and we have a bunch of images that go with Yaxchilan, uh, which is in the region of Mexico. So there are a bunch of different buildings. And then we also have this lintel that is something that we can talk about more specifically. Uh, so the Mayans really believed in ideal beauty. Uh, a lot of females were portrayed in their artwork. Uh, they also had a lot of shamanistic uh, ideas in their artwork. So if we talk about this lintel specifically, we see that it's in high relief. There's this really flat ground that's very deep, but there's not a lot of form. The pieces aren't rounded. So if we look at the body of this serpent, 
it's almost flat on top and then goes straight back. Uh, it's a way to create a lot of depth, but it's not, it's very stylized. It's not very realistic. The serpent's body doesn't feel round. It just has some small low relief details on the top. So what we see in the image here, we see a chakmul, which is just a depiction of a person who's half seated and half lying down. And this would have been a female uh, who is participating in a bloodletting ceremony. And we see what she sees in this vision, which is a vision serpent with two heads coming out of it. Um, now, this would have been something if she drank some potions or ate something, she started to see these vision serpents. And what's really interesting about this lintel is some of the text that's depicted here uh, is actually in reverse. So we don't exactly know why that is, but the idea um, a lot of scholars believe it's that she is seeing this vision, so she's in this other world, which is connecting her to this text in the other uh, direction, backwards. Um, so pyramids were central to civic life, so there were a lot of these structures that aren't exactly pyramids, but they've got that kind of pyramidal form, um, and different ones would be dedicated to different people. A lot of the structures were built using post and lintel, which if you remember back to like Stonehenge, we have two posts on the side, and then the lintel would be the piece that goes across the top. They also used a lot of corbel arching uh, to create these forms. So corbel arching just as a review, you have a lot of these stones on the side, and then as they get um, to create the arch at the top, they just move in a little bit more and more. So then you have stones that kind of are on top of one another. Um, they also did a lot of this roof comb decoration. This would be to add some vertical decoration. It's really just that, um, and add some height to the structure. But it's really just a, it looks like a waffle almost, placed on top of the stone structure. Uh, let's move on. We'll talk about the Aztecs next. So we have two main works that we look at for this. We have the Templo Mayor, which is this top one, the major temple, and then we have the ruler's feather headdress uh, down below. So let's start with the Templo, well we'll start with some overall here. So this is a little bit of a later time period. Um, what we know about the Aztecs is that they were very aggressive, especially in their religious practices, meaning there was a lot of bloodless letting a lot of sacrifice, some dismembering as well. Uh, they were rich in gold, uh, and they also had a strong appreciation of art objects from past cultures, uh, and they used superimposition, which we'll talk about in a minute. So let's start with appreciation of art objects. So this is an Olmec mask. An Ol the Olmecs were people that came uh, way before the Aztecs, and this was actually found in a burial site uh, here at the Templo Mayor. So what it tells us is that they would find art objects and appreciate them and keep them with them and even bury them with people. So it was something that was uh, prized and um, tells us a little bit more about their culture. Uh, let's move on and we'll talk about this. So this is one of the pictures that you could see on the exam. It is the actual Templo Mayor structure and it's a drawing of it to give you an idea of that superimposition um, process. So what it's showing is that each level of the temple uh, basically, it was constructed and rebuilt over and over and over again and made bigger and bigger and bigger. So six times this temple and pyramid structure were rebuilt and they basically added on to the structure each time. So um, this was over many, many years that this happened. Uh, if we look at the depiction a little more, we have two temples sitting on top of the pyramid structure. So those would be places dedicated to the gods. And then there were two staircases that would go down. And this flat area at the top, uh, you can kind of see there's something shown here on one of the levels below. This would be where rituals would take place. Uh, they would do sacrifices. Um, they would hold ceremonies so that all the people down below could see. And they would do those on top of the calendar stone. So this stone kind of um, appreciates their... Uh, idea of the calendar, their understanding of time passage, uh, but it was also just the place where rituals would take place. Then they would take the bodies of their enemies, which they sacrificed, and they would throw them down the stairs to what is below here. And this is this stone right over here. So if you remember, this is a depiction of a goddess who's been dismembered. So you can see that the arms, uh, legs are all uh, taken off, the head is kind of at a, a strange angle. And so bodies would be thrown down onto this stone below. Uh, very uh, aggressive, uh, 
for us looking at this piece, but this was a, a part of their culture and a part of their religious beliefs as well. All right, let's look now at the beautiful headdress here. So we believe this was for an Aztec ruler and then eventually was um, given to Cortez um, to take to the Spanish as a gift. So there's a lot of gold in, involved and there's also these beautiful, beautiful green uh, feathers that come from male Quetzal birds. Uh, each male has only two of these feathers. So if you think about how many birds were captured and plucked, just those two feathers, this is tons and tons of really, really beautiful um, uh, animal product that was used in this feathered headdress. This is really the only one like it that we have, so it's a really interesting art object that tells us more about Aztec culture. All right, let's talk about the Inca. So this is in the region of Peru, so think of the Chavin uh, being earlier, and then the Incans were a lot later. So they're kind of known for having more remote places for their architecture. They're known for ashlar masonry, which we'll review in a minute. Um, they had a huge, vast empire on the coast that connect, was connected with a really vast road system. They also didn't have written language uh, and also were rich in gold. So let's start with talking about the city of Cusco and the walls at Sascawama, which we have these two images down below here. Okay, so this was a city center, the heart of the Incan capital, uh, the heart of the empire, and the ground plan shown here is in the shape of a puma. You can kind of see the head of the puma here. Here would be like the belly or the heart, and it just doesn't have those legs on the actual image. And so they did this because the puma was considered a royal animal. So we know that the head part of the puma was where they had all of these really important fortified walls. Uh, it was basically a fortress. And then the center, the heart part, was really the city center, uh, central square. So the a second image we have for the city of Cusco is the Temple of the Sun, which has been converted into a church uh, once, once the Spanish came uh, and took over. So both of these images show beautiful ashlar masonry, use of the stones that fit together really perfectly so they don't need any mortar. Uh, you can see it a little bit better when we look at this picture down below here. You can see how the stones, they're not perfect rectangles or anything, but they fit together like puzzle pieces, which is really, really impressive. Uh, this, when it was the Temple of the Sun, had uh, some astronomical and like sun solstice connections with where the windows were placed. It was believed that it was covered in gold on the outside and then all covered with gold on the inside too. So they were really rich in gold and they wanted to honor the sun, which was such an important part of their life with this piece. So if we look over at Machu Picchu, which we have these two images, I think you have one or two more, but these are basic pictures to show you everything. Uh, we have this very, very remote location where Machu Picchu was, re uh, was uh, built, uh, and they believe it was a royal retreat place, so a place to kind of get away for people. Uh, they would farm on the terraces, there were over 200 buildings on the site, and here we can see a little bit of the astronomical um, observation area. So that was an important part of their culture as well. As well. Even though this was very remote, remember they had really, really strong roads, which were um, allowed people to have really strong communication. So their empire was very vast, but because they had strong connections, they were able to keep it all uh, unified in that way. So we have two other art objects that we can look at, whoop, related to the Incans. Uh, we have the Altiokupu tunic. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. And then we have the maize cob um, up above it. So let's take a look at the tunic to begin with. This is believed to be worn by an Incan ruler. Uh, would have been a status symbol. So to wear a tunic like this with so many symbols on it just indicates your power or your status. Uh, other people might have tunics with less uh, symbolism or less of those squares, and that would um, indicate less power. So the symbols, even though they're extremely geometric and very patterned, they would have uh, meaning that indicated different people, different places, different events. So all of that together tells quite a story for the person who would be wearing it. Now the other piece that we have here, the maize cobs, 
This is made out of sheet me metal in a style that's called repoussé. So they would take flat pieces of sheet metal and they would put it over top of something that would create a pattern and punch through, not punch through all the way, but it would create all of these divots in it to make it look like corn. So these were believed to have been either placed in a, uh, a garden type area filled with all of these made of metal, or maybe this would be in one place with uh, a bunch of actual corn growing as almost a gift or an offering to the gods with hope that they'll have a fruitful uh, food source and a fruitful successful harvest. So it's almost like a present or a offering for uh, the gods in relation to their harvest because corn was so important and sun was so important to their culture. All right. Let's move on. We'll talk about the Anasazi or the ancestral Puebloans and the Mississippians. So we're moving into Northern Native American cultures. Uh, there are lots of different ones, very, very diverse that we cover. Uh, these are two of the older ones, so we'll start with them. So the ancestral Puebloan, uh, they have connections to modern day Pueblo Native Americans, um, and they were in the American Southwest. So originally these people uh, wouldn't have been in this cliff dwelling. They would have been more in a flat plateau area, uh, but something caused them to move to this area. And ancestral Puebloans would uh, live with their clan. So there would be multiple clans um, in different structures, but we're just specifically looking at this one because it's such a unique uh, place. So Pueblos were their homes. They would build these. And in this case, they built it into the side of the cliff. So using rubble mortar, polished stone, they would put it um, into this cliff area, um, kind of cutting into what was there, but then also adding in to create these separate rooms. So each family would have a separate room that they would live in, and then the clan would be all together, and there would be multiple levels to it. Now the way this was accessible, and is still accessible, is from ladders, and they have some staircases they've built now from above to come down. So very, very difficult to access, which helps create safety for people. Uh, they would move together, so this was a place that eventually the clan moved um, and stayed for a while. Um, we also know that the plateau above, this is where they would be doing their farming. It's also where they would get their water uh, and anything else they might need uh, would be kept up there. So then they would bring it down for the people who are living there. Now they obviously get a lot of shade from living in this area, which would have helped with the climate um, to keep things cooler. And then up top, they'd get the sun that they needed for their crops to survive. All right, if we move over and talk about the Mississippians, we're talking about a kind of similar range of time period. This would be in the Eastern United States. And they would create effigy mounds. There were a bunch of different cultures that created effigy mounds. A lot of times there were burials involved with them, but this one, there's nothing buried underneath it. It's one that has kind of um, puzzled a lot of historians. We don't really know why it was built, um, the purpose of it or anything like that. Uh, but agriculture was really, really booming in this region. And so there was a larger population uh, uh, and people would be coming to fertile areas to make their homes. And mound building was a huge part of Mississippian culture. We have multiple different ones. We don't exactly know why they did it, especially because unless you're from an airplane, you cannot see the whole image together. And they probably didn't have airplanes at the time. Uh, so there's also some connections to astronomy. Uh, and uh, the head points to the summer solstice. So this is a rattlesnake uh, depiction. Snakes for them uh, indicated crop fertility. Uh, but yeah, without the burials, it's really kind of interesting why this exists. It's up on a hill, so there are valleys on either side, so it's really, really prominent. Uh, however, we don't really know what the, the main purpose was behind it. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk about some more traits that many Northern Native American tribes have in common. So a lot of uh, different tribes would uh, use local products to wherever they lived. Uh, most of them were nomadic or semi-nomadic. Uh, geometric designs were used quite a bit, and even when there was more imagery that uh, told more of a story, it's still simplified, very geometric. And they would also use a lot of new media mixed with their traditions. So when Europeans began to settle in the region, uh, they would introduce new materials, 
that uh, Native Americans would incorporate into what they made. Uh, there was also a great tourism trade because European settlers were really interested in the things that were being created by Native Americans and they wanted to take them back to Europe or use uh, in their own colonies. So let's start with the bandolier bag over here. So this was by the Lenape tribe uh, in around 1850. So this is something that is beautifully ornamented with a lot of beadwork. Um, beads were only used on these uh, bandolier bags after contact with the Europeans because they were actually imported uh, from Europe. The pouch, it's a func functional piece, but also decorative. So it would be something that this part would go across the chest and then the bag would hang down on the side. Uh, so things could be carried. And it was something that showed uh, status because it's so ornate and detailed. It's something that uh, would show your wealth or your uh, power. All right, if we move on, let's talk about Maria Martinez's piece, the black on black ceramic vessel. Uh, this was also done by her husband, Julian. Uh, so this is done with black on black polishing and matte surfaces to create this kind of two-tone black effect, which is really beautiful. Uh, it's a revival of old Puebloan uh, traditions. So she was really interested, uh, if you notice, she's 20th century. She was really interested in bringing back some of the old um, imagery, the geometric abstract patterns, and the styles of pottery from uh, ancestral Puebloan uh, artists. So she did a lot of research, uh, did a lot of digs to try and find and learn about those. Now she's also an artist that kind of played into this tourist trade. She'd make these pieces, her husband would do the painting most of the time, uh, and then they became highly sought after art objects by uh, people outside of Native American culture. So she kind of was bringing this Native American uh, belief or um, style to other other people. All right, let's move down the next one, Painted Elk Hide. This is believed to be done by Kadzi Cody. Uh, and this is a piece with narrative on the surface, uh, a lot of abstracted, simplified forms. And this could have been worn as almost a robe or something that you could drape around you. It also could have been something more for decoration. Uh, once again, really influenced by the tourist trade. Uh, the imagery on here actually talks about the past of the um, of the specific tribe. It's more it's showing bison and hunting scenes and um, different dances that weren't really performed anymore at the time it was made. So this is something that was probably done for a tourist market that was interested in seeing how they were in the past. We have abstracted teepees. We have some of the dancing going on. We have the hunting with the bison in the black. Um, so all just decorative probably talking about a nostalgic uh, view of the past, adding that narrative in, and all very simplified. All right, our last piece, which is one of my favorite in this unit, is our transformation mask. And this is by the Kwak Waka Waka, I think, uh, from the late 19th century. So this is more uh, in the northern Canadian coast uh, where um, this specific tribe lived. Uh, and we have a mask that has an outside bird type image. And then when it opens up, you have this human face inside. So remember, there's that hybrid of animal and human. We also have a lot of abstracted geometric forms added on the surface as well. So this is actually a great piece to compare to a lot of the African masks that we've talked about too, because it's about connecting to the spirit world. It would be performed. So it was something that would transform the wearer and it would be something that you could pull a string and it would open up as you're performing. So there'd be this transition from bird to human and they'd be doing this around fire with music. And so it would be this really kind of intense experience where you see these animals in this darkness with the light, uh, and hearing the music while they danced, and it really connected uh, people to this spiritual experience as well. Uh, it would be worn with a full body costume, um, and it was just a really interesting piece to connect to the spirit world. There are lots of different style ones. Um, it's not always bird and human. There would be lots of different ones that would open in lots of different ways as well. All right. So a couple other things to consider with this unit. Uh, both of these pieces are from our global prehistory unit from the region. Uh, so we will be talking about them in our next review video. But you can see there's that animal-human hybrid. This one made of the pelvic bone of a camelid. Uh, we also have the one that's more ceramic that shows details in the face and the hair. Uh, also shows kind of this 
emphasis on fertility. So we'll talk about those more. I think it's also important here to look at some of our early European and colonial America works that kind of tie in as well. So think about that influence of when the Europeans came and how things shifted. A lot of these pieces that were a little later, we're starting to see some of the styles that are known in Europe brought into the cultures in the Americas, or in some cases, the media. And in some cases, I mean, this even has some connections to Japan too. So we're seeing this really like cultural, um, connected, interdisciplinary place uh, with the style of art in this region as it grows. All right, so just to finish it off, a couple of things to think about. What are some differences between early indigenous cultures dependent on their region and cultural practices. So if we look at maybe some of the Native Americans versus the Mesoamericans, what do we see that's different? What cultural beliefs and practices influence the art objects created? How does the art of the indigenous people shift as uh, European settlers arrive? And then what stylistic and content changes occur in the works themselves? So some things to think about as you review. Good luck. And I'll talk to you soon.